Okay, I think it's time. Maybe we can start now. Uh, we have uh, different participants uh, connected at this moment. Okay, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Josep uh, Duart. Um, I'm in Barcelona at the Open University of UK, and now I'm moderating this session as a executive uh, committee member of EDEN. Um, and I will be the chair of this, of this uh, webinar. As you know, this uh, webinar is hosted by EDEN Special Interest uh, Group uh, on Technology Enabled Learning and Quality enhance, uh, Enhancement. And now uh, the topic of this uh, webinar uh, will be also a new global challenge for quality development in, on, in open and online learning. And we will have uh, um, with us uh, <clears throat> the, the speaker, it's old Daniel Ellers, uh, who will speak in a few minutes. Um, the way that we will organize this uh, webinar is uh, in different moments. The now it's this welcome and introduction, and now I, I'll, I'll give the, the, the floor to uh, Eva uh, in order to uh, introduce also even a special interest group. And later, the, the, our speaker will start with the presentation um, uh, that will be around 30 minutes. And after that, we, we can have a, a period, probably 30 minutes more, uh, to, to ask questions and to debate about uh, the topic of the session, of the today's session. Okay, I think that it's uh, everything at the moment, just to start. Uh, maybe, uh, Eva, if you can, if you will start with the presentation of the Eden Special Interest Group, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for the kind introduction for this uh, webinar. Uh, yes, I will start. Um, I'm Abosha Nelson, and I'm um, also in the Eden EC Executive Committee, and I also represent the uh, Swedish Association for Distance Education. I'm based in Sweden. And I'm also the coordinator for this uh, new launched uh, Eden Special Interest Group on Technology and Able Learning and Quality Enhancement. Um, Yes, the practical thing as well, uh, before we, we get started, is that this uh, session will be recorded and um, the link will be uh, sent to you who have participant, participated and it will, will also be uh, announced at the EDEN webpage. Hmm. I think what I can see from um, the participants, I think you are all familiar with uh, EDEN, but um, I will just say something uh, shortly uh, about what EDEN is and uh, why we are interested in uh, to um, contribute to quality enabled learning and quality enhancement. And today we have a really, really uh, challenging uh, topic, I will say, because there are so many changes which um, we have to face in all educational sectors, which we will discuss today. Um, so we have already introduced uh, the speakers for this uh, webinar. It's Rosanna uh, Ellers, and it's myself, and it is Joseph. So shortly about EDEN. EDEN is the European Distance and E-Learning Network. I'm sure you all are familiar with it. Um, it has been um, for some 25 five years old. Five years ago, it was launched together with uh, actually many of the other organizations like UCAN and EAD2U. And at that time, it was uh, really a large need for this kind of organization, dealing with um, uh, e-learning, distance learning. So Eden is um, to share knowledge and um, improve understanding amongst professionals in distance and e-learning and to promote policy and practice across the whole of Europe and beyond. So we work <clears throat> both with, with our members, to our members, but also at policy level with the European Commission, for example, and with other organizations. We have some 200 institutional members, and some 1,200 um, people are involved in our network of academics or professionals, the NAP, and I see that uh, we have uh, Alfredo Evanger, who is uh, in the, in the um, board of Eden NAP. For those who, who don't know what Eden App is, we have a special web page on Eden. Uh, it is for a community, and we have um, 
uh, let this uh, community be free, although you are not a member in Eden, if you would like to take part and to be in our community. Uh, we organize the conferences, uh, first the large annual conferences, but also the research workshops, and we have open classrooms, uh, and we are, are involved in projects, uh, research, and uh, publications. And we have our own um, uh, journal, Eurobook, and maybe some of you have already published uh, something and contributed, either as, um, with some research or maybe you are a reviewer. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so we had discussed for a while about uh, to, to do something special about technology-enabled learning and quality enhancement with Eden, because it is really important and it's really um, urgent needs to uh, review the quality agenda uh, with, ever, with all the challenges which we will he hear more about uh, from our presenter, Ulf Danielelos. There need to be a change also to, uh, looking at quality and how we are dealing with that. So we launched uh, actually this uh, thing uh, in a Daniel conference in, uh, in June in uh, Sweden for Daniel conference. And um, we did that with um, four uh, workshops for each of the days during the conference with those uh, themes which are presented here about the rationale and action plan, about reviewing the quality agenda, about quality and tell at micro, meso, and macro level, and identifying the stakeholders and uh, innovation of, for quality and leadership. And for two of the special sessions, where Daniel Ellis also involved for the second one and for the fourth one. Uh, we are a um, core group, uh, mainly uh, from um, the Eden EC. It is myself who is coordinating it. It is Sandra Kujina Soxi, who is the vice, uh, uh, vice president of Eden. It is Mark Nichols from Local University. It is Maria Bologovic, who is the president. It is Antonella Porsche from uh, Eden NAP, and the former uh, president um, for Eden, Antonia, Antonio Texera, and Daniel Enos as an expert. And we have some newcomers as well, as uh, for example, Jack Comey is coming in, and also some others. But to be in the core group, you need to be an Eden member, but uh, we are launching this to, think, to be a community for everyone who have an interest in the area. So please feel free, free to be welcome. Uh, what are we doing? Um, for this first semester, we have, um, uh, we have an action plan, because we would like to do a lot of things, but we have to start in a rather small scale. Uh, so we started to have webinars, and the e also even tweet chats. So uh, this is one, the second webinar uh, today. And some weeks ago, we had another one, and that was about uh, quality intel and micro meso le and macro level. And the recording from that is available uh, to Eden, uh, Eden web page. Uh, we're also doing a tweet chat. So uh, next week, um, we are hosting one, and uh, that is also facilitated by uh, Daniel Ellis about actually the same topic as uh, today. But I think it will be in a a more different way, it is maybe more interactive with uh, the tweets. And those tweets uh, are, um, tweet chats are um, storified, so they are also available afterwards. So please feel free, free to be welcome on next week as well. Uh, we have chosen the, the concept of technology-enabled learning, because that covers uh, both distance learning, e-learning, blended learning, mobile learning, uh, online learning, uh, you know, all the all the names which are used to be uh, on the on the agenda. We have chosen the broad concept technology enabled learning. We are also choosing the concept of enabling instead of enhancing, because enhancing is what is better, what is uh, not so good. Uh, it is more a question of this kind of things. But enabling is to to empower, to make things possible. Um, and to make possible for for uh, for learning for and for for learners and for the students to um, what kind, whatever kind of ways they are learning through and by technology or digitization. This is also the the um, definitions of by um, the Commonwealth of Learning, the report by Kickwood and Price. 
we are also uh, talking about uh, technology and uh, enabled learning and quality enhancement, both on micro level, meso level, and macro level. And that is important to sometimes distinguish between those. But it's also uh, important to see, see all levels as, a, uh, as an entity, because quality is not so stronger than the weakest link. So if there are gaps in between those different kind of levels, there will be gaps in quality. Uh, that was really discussed uh, last uh, webinar. So if, if you're interested, more interested about that, you can go back to the recording. But in the end of the day, uh, quality is much so what's in it for me. What's in it for me as a learner, that is the point. Uh, <clears throat> I will also share with you some of the reports which are recently published uh, in the topic. The one by uh, Duval uh, et al, Technology Enhanced Learning. The one I have already mentioned about Cape Verde and Price for Commonwealth of Learning. So um, that was a very, very brief introduction for what the, the, this special interest group on talent and quality enhancement is about. We have at the web webpage, we have a um, special uh, section for uh, this thing. You are more than welcome to have a look there. And you are more than welcome to be part of our community and to have a contact with all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eva, for this uh, map and even special interest group introduction. And now it's time uh, for uh, of Daniel Ellers, uh, is our speaker today, uh, about the topic is new global challenges for quality development in open online learning. Uh, please, uh, Daniel, Wolf Daniel, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Joseph. Uh, and greetings to everybody from my side here as well. Uh, we are a small group, so feel free to ask questions uh, in between when they arise. Don't wait too long. Don't be shy. Um, my topic is quality in uh, open online learning, and uh, I have chosen not to uh, take a very narrow focus, but to uh, enlarge the focus for today's presentation and to also have a look a little bit what's going on actually in higher education. Um, because what's going on in higher education is actually determining uh, what we have to take into account when talking about quality and when shaping the agenda of the steps which we need to take to meet the challenges. So um, I approach the topic from a rather broad view today and uh, still I hope that the initiatives which I have put in my presentation, um, European initiatives and some, some tools might be of interest for those who are more interested in the details and the criteria and the regulations and processes. So first of all, I think um, when we look at higher education like a, a game of chess, uh, and uh, I believe that everybody probably knows uh, how to play chess or has played chess uh, once uh, in their lives, then we all know that uh, the rules are actually very, very clear. You know what you are able to do with the different uh, players, with the different uh, um, little figures. You know where to go, you know what to do, and um, uh, you know that, of course, there is strategic thinking possible and um, uh, also very, very uh, important, um, but you know the game. And I always like to think about um, digital technology coming in and we are always talking or using the term disrupting higher education. Um, and I always like to think about it in a way that what is happening there is that suddenly our playground is enlarged. It's not eight by eight fields anymore, uh, but it's becoming larger and larger. The figures can go 
different ways can jump further and there are no boundaries anymore. And the question is, what do we do? Imagine you are um, a leader in a higher education institution, higher education institution manager or rector or president. Then you probably would like to know what is the movements I can do and suddenly you see yourself in a situation where the rules are changing and you are in a situation where you have to fly by night a little bit without exactly knowing and seeing what is my room and my option which I have. This is what leaders of higher education tell us. We have started to work with uh, presidents and vice presidents since uh, one and a half years in different contexts and they all are having different stories to tell but the stories they are all coming to this point that they say we have no idea what in five years time our universities will look like but we are still in a situation in which our colleagues want to know this from us and that's a difficulty so there's a need for uh, orientation and um, if you think about this the question what the future actually will bring and how it's going to look like and if we are on the right tracks and if the tracks are still able to carry the tanker the organization um, of the university uh, that is the big question and that is more and more becoming a question actually um, and there are no simple answers to that just a small picture which shows where we are moving it higher education is changing and the changes are coming from at least two big factors. One factor is the global move to learning societies. If you have a look at the OECD statistics of higher education participation of young people, of the young age cohorts, you will find that the participation in higher education is becoming larger and larger. That is that we are not actually only moving towards learning societies where education and learning and certification of education and learning becomes uh, an important means for differentiation and mobility within a society which determines the position you can take. But also within this movement of becoming a learning society, the academic part, the higher education portion, is actually becoming more and more important. And with that, also the risks of individuals in society, they are changing. Whereas uh, education before, used to be an option which everybody desired to have in the future and today already it is becoming more and more an obligation which you cannot avoid to have and so it is in a way a spiral which is reinforcing this movement towards a learning society and on the other side, there is, of course, the big movement of digitalization, which changes, first of all, all moments and methods and modes which we have to deliver content between teachers and learners, between institutions and learners. But it changes also much more. And this is, I think, the bigger picture which we can see where we see that higher education is under pressure of at least these two big mega trends, which leads on the one hand side to an enlargement of 
individual, individualized academic education where standard offers in the future will not be enough anymore. It leads to a new challenge for universities because a much more diverse target group is coming into the academic education and it leads also to a need for more lifelong learning offers of higher education institutions because in an age in which individuals will have 10 to 15 jobs between the end of their job training and the beginning of their retirement, they all need constant training, constant learning. And so academic institutions have to ask themselves, how can we provide not just the initial academic bachelor and master degree, but how can we provide the same intensity throughout the whole lifetime? And globally speaking, there are no structures yet developed which enable individuals in our modern societies to be provided with academic training uh, in that way and that quantity and that intensity which is needed. Alongside with this digital megatrend, there are lots of questions which uh, the stakeholders around, the students, the teachers, the management is asking. Some of them are, will the digital turn be a technical one or an educational? Will it be a technical revolution or an educational revolution? And some of the stakeholders are fearing that there is um, an automatic uh, change just through the technology coming which cannot be shaped anymore in a way that they believe it would be good. So the question is really, how can we shape the future uh, and not just, just be overwhelmed by it? The question is, of course, for our closed institutions, how can we deal with openness? When students come in and say, we have learned something from other institutions' online courses, and we would like to bring it here into our own um, higher education um, uh, program. How do we deal with this openness? How do we deal with the fact that there is more and more digital import into curricula from other institutions or other um, uh, programs? And also that we have the possibility of digital export from our institution to other institutions. How to create a suitable blend of institutional formats is a question which we are now have started just this week to kick off a new project, a European initiative, which is looking exactly into these kind of patterns that students in the future will start in University 1 and then they might move to another university and to a third university to get their academic programs, their education. And then the question is, how can we track their learning? How can we combine their learning that from these individual experiences, we can create one larger certification, one larger academic qualification? And how to achieve permeability is another big issue on the European scene. We have just issued a policy paper. I am also involved into the European Association for Institutes of Higher Education, which is one of the big four e-institutions which have authored the European standards and guidelines. And in this institution, it is one of our key concerns to work for permeability so that students from the qualification framework level three, four, five can enter into higher education as well, into master level education as well, and that there are no silos and no boundaries, um, or at least that they can be overcome. 
So these are some of the questions which arise from the overall bigger picture and how difficult it is today in educational institutions in general, but specifically in higher education institutions, to determine what future needs of students and graduates are. Uh, you can see from this thought experiment which we did. If you think about the school beginner in September 2016, which um, by the way was actually my own story because I have a small son who was entering school in September 2016. He's now in second grade and he probably will finish uh, primary school by 2020. And then he will graduate from high school in 2028 and he will receive his bachelor degree in 2031 and his master degree in 2033 if he chooses to study um, and then he might start to work or not uh, or continue in the university like his father nobody knows um, so think about this timeline now and think about uh, what has happened in the last 10, 15 years. And we are looking here at a time frame from today, 2017, 2018, to 2030, 2033. Uh, is it actually possible to determine what the future will bring? Which jobs will be there actually? In which time frames will qualifications need to be updated in 2033? And so, actually what is important today in universities is not so much to deliver to students knowledge, but what is really important is to deliver to students the ability to deal with new situations, with unknown situations, with uncertain situations. That's the new currency of higher education. And now, Probably all of you are somehow involved in a higher education institution. Think about it. Think about your own institution, your own experience. Think about what you have in front of you and how well we prepare or not our students to deal with this uncertainty. For many institutions, I can say, and many colleagues, which I discuss this topic with, we are still living often in the illusion that what we do when we transfer knowledge is preparing students for the future. But I firmly believe that's a mistake. So my agenda for quality challenges in higher education is comprising five points which I want to make. The first one is the point how can we deal with innovation and employability in a situation where we do not know what the future mm. brings? The second point is, how can we deal with access and inclusion? The third point, how to deal in a high quality way with individualization and diversity? The fifth, is the challenge of flexibilization and the fifth sorry is the challenge of digitalization so you can see here that digitalization plays a role and is probably underlying many other points as well but it's just one factor out of many here i would like to talk a little bit about the challenge of innovation and employability in our universities, we are often teaching content. And I already mentioned that in the future, it will less and less be possible to prepare students for situations by teaching them the knowledge they will need. Because the situations will be so diverse so quickly changing and so individual that it is barely impossible to teach them everything they need to know for their job lives. What we need to focus on, and that's not a contradiction with 
teaching knowledge and um, what we need to focus on is we need to focus on more on what we call competence. Competence is not a term which is understood in English in the same way than in other languages uh, or in German. So I would like to define it. Competence is defined as the ability to act self-organized and successfully in a future situation which is now unknown and complex. So you see already that if you are aiming at that, it is no use to teach students safe answers or safe questions. But what we have to do in the future more and more is to turn to confronting students with questions for which there are no right or wrong answers in order to teach them to deal with this insecurity and this complexity of an unknown future. And often this kind of pedagogical models this kind of learning design which is necessary and which involves the confrontation with the complex problems is seen as a contradiction to knowledge transmission which is the often still uh, predominant model in higher education. But what you can see here in the middle of the slide is that it's actually not a contradiction, but that the different aspects build on each other. So there's a very nice work which was done by one of the great, at least German professors and thinkers of higher education development. And he's very much promoting that information and knowledge are the precondition to develop the ability to act in a competent way, in the sense which I described just before. But it's not enough to stop at conveying knowledge. That's just the beginning. In order to become competent and then to move even higher up the ladder, to be, become professional in a certain domain, you need to start to deal with this knowledge and you need to start to reflect on this knowledge and you need to start to deal with values and you need to um, allow to be shattered and to be uh, labelized in discussions, to be touched, emotionally impregnated uh, through the teaching and learning process. And I already mentioned it, that uh, is the third element on the, on the, sli on the slide, that um, reflection is very, very important. And this is just one model which uh, Schoen was actually developing, the model of the reflective practitioner, which is basically saying that our aim should be to develop professionals, which in every moment are possible to reflect and question their actions and reflect on their actions in a way that, that they can ad hoc develop strategies and can ad hoc develop individual action theories. So that's what really competence, the, the, the term in higher education is about, which we need to develop in order to prepare students for this kind of uncertain future. And again, the question to everybody would be, where are we? What do you think in your context? Where are you there actually? We know that the certain teaching strategies are more likely uh, supporting this kind of uh, uh, educational experience and that's the one of course you know uh, which are more the one which uh, are towards, uh, turned towards social practices, uh, interaction, uh, reflection, coaching, in which uh, the implicit uh, assumption is that education can only be an enabling, teaching can only be an enabling process uh, and that there is no clear 
uh, connection, no direct connection between a teaching act and the learning act, because learning is always seen uh, as a self-organized process. I come to my second point, access and con inclusion. And uh, I think this is uh, pretty straightforward. If you think about higher education uh, from the first higher education institution, which is actually the Bologna institution, sometimes Bologna fights a little bit with Montpellier and says, uh, Montpellier says, well, we had a, a medicine, medical faculty which is even earlier than Bologna, but uh, generally in common, uh, we think that uh, Bologna, the Bologna campus was the first higher education uh, institution, the first university. And of course, this was higher education for the exclusively chosen very few, uh, the elite. Then if you turn the wheel of time forward very, very many years and very quickly, um, in industrialization age, the need was becoming bigger and bigger to have a very well-educated workforce. And this workforce was to be educated to meet clear, standardized, described, and defined qualifications. Because this was what was needed um, in the factories of the industrialized process. Uh, and we are still in there, actually. We are still there um, that we, in our philosophy and our underlying approaches to higher education believe that the clear defined curricula can educate the students of today for the job qualification needs they have in the future. Now if you think about what would be the next step and sometimes you see that already you can uh, again in terms of architecture I've tried to uh, uh, represented here in the slides, you can say that um, it is a postmodern, disaggregated architecture. Architecture. This is the uh, Stater Center um, of uh, the MIT, and the building tries to represent this kind of individualized mix and rip postmodern educational philosophy. So basically, that leaves us with the career of an idea of higher education, which leads from the traditional model over the modern, today existing model, to the postmodern model in which we can talk about individualized and diversified higher education. So the access to higher education is becoming rapidly massified and the participation rates will, until 2050, grow and grow and grow in industrialized uh, countries, as far as the OECD is concerned, at least, um, but also in the uh, other continents and parts of the world, especially the one which are industrializing now, especially the one which are the uh, threshold uh, countries. Um, and then, after this phase, of qualifying students, graduates, in a standardized way, we will more and more move into an era in which it will become important to teach students according to their needs, according to the contexts in which they are, and according to the time frames which they choose they want to be taught after having a family, before having a family, in between jobs, later in life or earlier in life. So there is a, an issue of access and inclusion here, which needs to be um, an underlying, uh, an underlying, which is an underlying um, development, which needs to be taken into account when thinking about quality in higher education. How can we cater for the individual needs which are there. The third point, individualization and diversity. What we can see today is that there are at least three drivers which are um, bringing about uh, a more individualized learning. Um, 
One is the modernization of the world of work. We can see that more and more there is a re resolution of a system of fixed professions. We used in higher education, we are still used to orienting our curricula which we are having um, on basis, to create our curricula on basis of clear defined professional um, qualifications so that our graduates are able to fulfill um, the jobs which are defined. But we are more and more moving into um, a situation uh, in which this system of fixed and defined um, professions uh, is giving way towards a flexible um, and competence-oriented uh, and um, enlarged and enhanced uh, job uh, understanding of professionalism in which students have to continuously grow and continuously self-develop in a self-organized way uh, is existing. So in a way we are moving from a lifetime employment to um, uh, a life uh, uh, a lifelong learning um, uh, in a way and um, uh, from um, um, a situation in which uh, we think about graduates as the future professionals which are employed um, to thinking about um, uh, entrepreneurial work which is done which has to be done in the um, organizations more and more. The second point which leads to individualization is the flexibilization of the world of education. Um, some points I talked uh, already uh, about, uh, we can see that there is a flexibilization of degrees in a way uh, that informal and non-formal learning are becoming more and more important. Um, in a conference two weeks ago, uh, we had um, many discussions about this actually. And we had discussions in which uh, people said, today it is less and less important to become a job, to, to, to uh, um, get a job, uh, to have a good um, um, credential. Today it is more and more important to be, 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 to be able to demonstrate uh, the experience which I bring, also and specifically from the informal and non-formal sector. Then, of course, the flexibilization of curricula and of learning contexts uh, is more um, present today than ever. We are looking at modularization of education, so students can uh, choose their learning pathways uh, in a way more and more then key qualifications and competencies become more and more important. In the future, um, it will not so much be important and for quality development, that is a key issue actually, what uh, students know, but it will be important what they are able to do, what are their competencies, and um, that will be depending on the social and emotional abilities they are having. It will be important to be able to take perspectives, to um, take different points of view. Uh, that is actually what computers cannot do today. And the attitude and the um, underlying philosophy people have towards life, the value system which is behind here. Uh, what, where do I know from what is right or wrong, actually? Um, academic education uh, no longer will have to focus on uh, just transferring knowledge, but the, it, it, it will have to focus on giving students a compass, giving students a direction how they can orient uh, in a more and more complex, complex world. An OECD study, uh, which was just actually um, uh, out uh, a few, few uh, weeks ago, uh, was comparing in 60 countries what are the most important main key competencies in these countries? 
And the first one from a list of 10 was to create something new, to be creative. That is, in higher education, the first and foremost important key competence in a study in 60 countries. The second one is to deal with tensions, to be successfully, um, uh, to be able to act successfully in insecure situations. And the third one was to take over responsibility, um, to decide yourself for things. So you can see that uh, there is a big um, change uh, towards individualized learning because of these different um, uh, points, these different X aspects. Okay, and um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Wolf, I'm sorry because I, uh, we have uh, uh, just a few minutes, uh, in order to have a few minutes at the end to have so, uh, questions and comments. Um, it could be great if you could finish in one or two minutes more. Yeah, I will try to do that. So what you can see here actually is that um, um, that there are underlying, so to speak, tectonic movements which lead uh, in society to a changed context, uh, so that individualized learning becomes more and more um, important. Individualized learning means that there needs to be a possibility to move between the different educational sectors. Permeability will become more important. And thirdly, um, this again leads to a situation in which recognition aspects, recognition processes uh, are becoming more important. When students are coming uh, with uh, some bits and pieces from um, higher education experiences and some bits and pieces from informal or non-formal education, and some bits and pieces uh, from training uh, and from vocational education. And this all needs to be recognized in a permeable um, educational environment, which is individualized and which is catered uh, for their needs. Then higher education uh, in total actually has a complete new quality challenge um, which uh, uh, I think uh, we have to uh, be very, very careful to understand, first of all, uh, and then also to try to turn our educational systems in this direction. I'm moving over some slides now, which are explaining this process of individualization a little bit more, the unbundling of provision and assessment in higher education. Um, I already told you that we have started new European initiatives on micro degrees uh, and on open recognition, uh, in which we are uh, thinking and aiming at creating a European uh, passport, actually, uh, as well, a European learner's passport, actually, as well. And uh, I come to uh, the last two points, flexibilization. I think that has become already very, very clear. Uh, through online technologies, we can digitally import curriculum, and that means that higher education pathways will not look in the future like today, where a student in University One uh, enters university and then learns and also gets a certification from the same university, but where students um, are in a situation where they can um, go different pathways, actually. And the last point, digitalization, as a, one of the big drivers, actually, but also a driver where we have no good answers to today. If content is digitally everywhere um, uh, uh, available, uh, what is then actually a convincing digital strategy for a presential university? It's a big question we still are discussing in many, many contexts, in national and in Europe. If you can learn everywhere, what do we do in the classroom? If learning communities are the big thing to network students together between themselves, with the teachers, with experts, how do we deal uh, with the situation today that students often perceive this kind of networking still as very artificial? How does it become natural? 
and learner generated content can we still or can we in the future uh, as professionals professional educators let go of our um, let's say monopoly of uh, uh, being the only ones who are allowed and able to provide uh, knowledge to learn. And then, of course, the whole world of open educational resources. Um, I jump over it a little bit and come to my second but last slide, uh, in which I would like to summarize again. I have shown some bits and pieces of what are the consequences of moving towards a learning society for higher education quality development? And I have also shown and concentrated on um, the digitalization, on the digital side. And I believe that both these are factors which are taking higher education institutions and systems in between them in a sandwich position, you can say, and will change this higher education systems towards more permeable, lifelong learning systems um, in which academic education is just a sequential approach throughout life and not one in the beginning, and in which many disassociation uh, processes will happen so that we become a new environment, actually, an ecosystem of education which might be organized or oriented like steward, stewards uh, by academics and by professors and by higher education institutions, but in which self-organization and individual pathways will play an enormous role. In the last years we have um, accumulated a lot of studies and knowledge about these kind of cultures which need to grow to enable and understand these processes which you can find here and with that i thank you very much and i apologize for taking a bit more of your time than uh, planned in the beginning thank you very much uh, uh, oh, thank you very much for this very interesting questions. speech and Thanks a lot. very suggestive for all of us uh, thank you very much um, don't worry about the time <laughs> then i I think it's important if we can, we have now almost 10 minutes uh, for questions, for comments uh, around your uh, topics, your ideas. Uh, if, is, if some of us, some of the participants want to uh, say something, please, you can use, um, you can raise your hand using the this uh, app. Uh, you can see this on the top of the screen, or you can write your uh, question on, on the chat as you prefer. Is there any comment, any question? If not, I see, here that, is... I see here that there is a question by somebody, uh, by Renata. How should we teach e-learning students according to the context? Many times, e-students do not have a possibility yes. of carrying out practical activities in on-site mode. I think this is the the the, the biggest challenge, actually, uh, to to think about. And um, if we would like to individualize learning in the way which I talked about. I think what we need to move away from is to move away from a thinking in which everybody learns the same thing at the same time with the same objective. And the only way to do that, in my view, is to use learning design patterns which allow students to learn on their own projects. Because if students are allowed and are also asked to learn on their own projects, project-based uh, or initiative-based learning, uh, then students can develop exactly those competences and those issues for them which are important in their context. 
Okay. I don't know if there's any another question. I don't know. He's typing something. But okay. I have a question. Have a, go ahead. I have a question, Daniel. Um, uh, thank you first very much. It was a really a uh, very broad uh, overview you you discussed or, or presented for us. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of challenges, uh, and you really pointed out uh, the, um, the broad picture. But um, I would like to ask you, uh, one of your slides was uh, from um, Schoen with the ladder. Uh, and um, as I know, Schoen, he is a Swede, and um, uh, his, uh, you also had uh, his books from 1983 and 1986. And um, uh, um, the issues on the ladder was really what very much what we are talking about now for, for learning. And imagine that it's 30 years ago, more or less, more, more or less exactly 30 years ago, he pointed out how we will deal with learning, how we will deal with education, and all those kind of things which you have presented for us. So I would like to ask you, um, why do we have this gap? Why are we still talking about this kind of, of issue? What, um, what is missing? I mean, we have been talking quite a, quite a long time uh, about those issues. So there must be something wrong in the system for a educational sector and educational system. What is your opinion? I think that um, there are several answers to your questions. Um, one is that society at large is constantly changing and there are constant new demands and we are now moving into a post-industrial age. Um, have not arrived there yet, but uh, in some of the economy uh, areas we see already um, that um, organizations are changing, that business models, service models are changing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so uh, it is only natural that uh, education is always a little bit also an observer of society and then tries to serve society uh, in the way which it needs. That's, but that's only one answer, I think. The other answer is that um, 30 years uh, in the history of universities are not a, not a long time, but are rather a small time, I think. Um, and what I always say is that um, the good thing with technology is that it is um, bringing us back to ans uh, asking the questions which are um, not so much important for the technological development is also important and interesting, but technology, when it enters educational institutions, is bringing up questions which actually have to do with educational beliefs and philosophies. And that's why I think that the whole issue of uh, online education and e-learning and technology-enhanced or enabled learning is very much of benefit to institutional development, educational institutional development, because we are put in a situation in which we have to answer questions from totally new perspectives. And we see that we cannot continue like we did before with participation rates, as I mentioned it, of more than 60% in the future of one age cohort in academic education. We will have to cater so many students in an individual way uh, that we have to develop new individualized answers to that. Um, and uh, I believe that's a benefit, actually, uh, and don't see it so much as a legacy. Okay, I think we have uh, one so question more from Leonora. Um, um, can you read it here on the chat? Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting speech. It gave much food for thought. I'm currently researching the quality of instructional design of MOOCs defined, uh, offered by Coursera based on the quality matters standards. Any recommendations? 
And of course, one of my reference is to our study on the pedagogical quality of MOOCs. Um, yeah, I think that uh, the quality of MOOCs um, is um, uh, an, an area uh, in which actually uh, the study of quality is um, on the one hand uh, something which we can um, find lots of inspiration in because MOOCs are um, interesting from several dimensions. They are often quite content oriented. Uh, they are often uh, in models where self-organization is very important, but other MOOCs are again uh, also a little bit social uh, oriented. Um, so to define criteria or to define quality for, for this kind of learning uh, is I think very, very necessary. And at the same time, it is uh, quite demanding, quite uh, demanding. Um, we have done uh, uh, a blog project uh, a couple of years ago um, in which we invited experts to uh, give their um, opinions on quality of MOOCs. Uh, and we found that um, apart from, let's say, the classical um, fields in which you say what is the pedagogy of the masses and, uh, and so on, uh, also, other interesting new uh, considerations came into the game, and that was a consideration. Is in a MOOC a dropout a problem or a built-in feature? So if somebody is stopping the MOOC without completing it, this kind of dropout. And this is a question which we in traditional education, also in traditional, more traditional online education, had, had a clear answer to, but which is coming up in MOOCs as a new question uh, in which we can rather say that probably somebody who didn't finish the MOOC um, is not a failure or a dropout or a problem, uh, but uh, is somebody who has taken his own self-organized approach to his own learning opportunities. So um, uh, it's a bit, uh, let's say, uh, uh, <laughs> not comprehensive what I'm saying now uh, towards your question, but to be honest, I feel not really able to answer the question very comprehensively because I think it's it's a very broad question which you answered. And there's one thing also, do you think it is correct for Spanish accreditation organizations, that's a question by Renata, to assess and certify e-learning programs by applying the same criteria models as the one applied to, to, to traditional uh, educational process programs. Well, um, yes and no. Um, that's a question which many countries are having actually. Um, those accreditation agencies which are focusing more on assessing the quality management system, they are actually asking the question, is a higher education institution able to perform quality management processes which are shaping the educational offers, the programs which they have in a way that it is beneficiary, uh, a benefit for students. So if you ask this question in such a broad way, you can apply it to traditional and to e-learning programs in the same way. If you now go a level deeper and you're saying, no, actually, I would like to have a look specifically at the delivery mode of a traditional versus an online program, then, of course, you cannot apply the same criteria mm -hmm. because you need to take into account different processes and different standards for student guidance, for um, teaching time for um, formats of delivery and you cannot so to speak apply exactly the same one on one uh, from the one uh, mode of delivery to the other mode of delivery so it, it depends a little bit um, in germany we are moving more towards um, accreditation of quality management systems mm -hmm. 
And in that, we are always saying a quality management system should be able to deal inherently with um, the different modes of delivery the university has. So we do not need a specific one okay. for e-learning. Thank you very much, uh, is, uh, uh, this is a very interesting topic, uh, a lot of interesting questions, and also I have myself two questions more, but we don't have time to do it, but just let me say something. Uh, uh, my question was related to the, uh, the network, uh, uh, how the network on, on, on different uh, universities, which is the role of the networks uh, in this uh, global quality uh, situation today, no? but we don't have time to, to comment that. Uh, thank you very much for your participation and also for the participation of the others, the people that uh, stay here during your uh, speech and also make some comments and questions to you. And I think now to, to finish uh, this webinar, Eva want to say something uh, just to close. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to, um, to say something uh, to close the, this uh, webinar. Um, First of all, I will thank you uh, uh, so much, uh, everyone who have participated uh, today, and of course, especially uh, with Daniel Ellis and Joseph um, Duart, and um, uh, on behalf of the special interest group on TEL and quality enhancement. And this was our second webinar uh, this uh, autumn, and we will have a tweet chat on next week. And um, our group has uh, or has just uh, started, so to say, and we have a rather um, comprehensive and um, active action plan for the next year for 2018. And um, please follow us um, uh, for our activities and please follow the webpage at Eden uh, webpage. And uh, we are collaborating with Eden NAS uh, very much with Antonella and, uh, Anto uh, and um, Alfredo who is also here today. So I think uh, um, both those the webinars uh, this autumn have really uh, already given a lot of food for thought, which, really, which we will um, continue and also to cultivate our discussions and our contributions within the field of quality enhancement in TEL. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.